interesting, an interesting study, and the Planet Pilgrimage has a rapid study through the book of James, a comprehensive little book. He talks about a lot of things in just five short chapters. An amazing study. And I hope you've enjoyed it. I have been blessed by having each of you here uh, for sessions as, as well. Did you know that we spend 50% of our time talking about or thinking about money or money-related things? Hmm. Money matters to Americans these days. In fact, uh, back a few years ago, you remember that famous statement, it's the economy, stupid, remember? Uh, that the president said, and now they're saying the same thing again in the election this time around because money really matters. But this is, so the Bible is a very practical book, so isn't it interesting that God being very practical and inspiring writers who are very practical would address this obsession we have with money because that is true in every generation. <coughs> The book is not just a book of ancient writings, it's a book of current issues, and it's talking about the very specific things that we deal with. In fact, Jesus talked about money a great deal. He was so interested in money that in Mark 12, he went to the temple treasury and watched how people gave in the treasury. He was like, I wonder what it would be like <laughs> if the pastor showed up. I, I, I have some, uh, actually some pastor friends of mine in other faiths and other races that I know that I actually stand by the door with the offering plate and everybody goes by and gives it a trunk mm. after I, you know, not that it matters. But I, I, and I was thinking to myself, what does it make any difference whether Jesus were there or the preacher or whomever was, was there? Jesus is watching anyway. Whether you do, don't, when you give, and, you know, that's it because he is paying attention. Nothing wrong with money, by the way. Um, this fifth chapter of James, is going to uh, talk about other topics, not just that one, but he starts with that, and we're going to talk about that one a little bit here. Money in itself is not evil. The Bible says that the, most, the, love of money. the love of money is the root of all evil. And so if we allow money to master us, that's when we get into trouble. Now it's interesting to me that James uses the same beginning, the same two words he used back in chapter 4, verse 13, as he says, beginning in chapter 5, verse 1, Come now. And then he says, you rich people, weep and wail over the miseries that are coming on you. Come now uh, actually uh, means, I want you to think about this. You know, I, I'm, I'm about to lay something on you you need to consider. This is a very important uh, message I have for you. And, of course, we look at this and we say, we, most of us think to ourselves, well, you know, he says, well, they come now, uh, rich people. Well, that's not me. <laughs> I don't have to worry about that too much because he's not addressing me. I'm not one of those. You'd be surprised, though, to know that in James' day, uh, if, to, to make the comparison contemporarily, the, the best way, I think, for me to put this is if, if you had had one, if you had, if today, if you had one car doing James' understanding of what was rich, what was not, one car, you had a man, a couple of man's suits or, or clothing for a man, a couple of women's dresses, if you had those simple, basic things in life, you would have been considered one of those to whom he was speaking because the standards in his day were so low that he was actually speaking to a lot more people than we think he was. Now, he wasn't speaking to the super wealthy people. He wasn't speaking to people who had uh, millions or billions or trillions of dollars. It's not wrong to have money. It's okay to have money, but when money dominates us and controls us, that's when it gets us into trouble. That's what we're going to talk about. And so God is... Teaching, as he teaches us uh, through James, he's teaching us to mature in Christ. That's God's goal for all of us, for us to mature in Christ. So we're talking about maturing in Christ. Uh, and we're talking about doing that through by succeeding through supporting others. So we succeed in maturing if we support other people. And there are three ways we do that. We're going to see those as we start in verse 1, verse 1 to 3, actually. We support others, first of all, through our possessions by activating idle wealth. Come now, you rich people, weep and wail over the miseries that are coming on you. Your wealth is ruined, and your clothes are moth-eaten. Your silver and gold are corroded. Their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You stored up treasure in the last days. Now here's what James is talking about here. I want you to notice that he talks about the clothes being ruined and moth-eaten. Their, their, their miseries are coming upon them, silver and gold corroded and all this. You know, let me, let me ask this. Do you know what a thesaurus is? A thesaurus is a book of words yeah. and has a tremendous uh, number of words in it, synonyms, anonyms. Well, 
They sarizo is the Greek word he uses here, which means to gather, to save, to store up. And this is what it means. He says in verse 3, you have stored these things up. He says, you had more than enough of all of these things that I'm talking about. You had more than enough of these things stored up and well beyond your needs. And so there was money uh, or there was wealth, which doesn't just include money, but other things as well as we're going to see. And so, in, in fact, uh, as we're going to look at the wealth of people in James Day, there were three things that determined their wealth. The grain, garments, and gold were the three things they looked at. They had great a number of a great amount of grain, wheat in their barns. If they had fine garments to wear, if they had gold on their fingers, they were wealthy. And so our criteria, of course, is a little different. If we're writing in, in this in our day, we talk about cash and stocks and bonds and real estate, treasury notes and those kinds of things. But the principle is the same. He's saying some people have a large ac accumulation. They have more than they need. And they have, they have set it up. They have put it away, stored it away. The Bible says we should prepare for our future. So there's nothing wrong with being prepared for the future. There's nothing wrong with having a savings account. Nothing wrong with saving. Nothing wrong with leaving an inheritance to, to the children if we choose to do that. It's proper for us to have enough to bring a tithe to the worship place. All of that's okay. It's, that's a good use of the money. Jesus taught us, lay up our treasures, though, where? In heaven. He said, if you're going to store up a lot of it, you know, it's all right to save up some. It's all right to be prepared for a rainy day. It's all right to be prepared to, to live throughout your uh, life expectancy. But Jesus said, store up your treasures and lay, up, lay them up in heaven. And what are those? I think he's talking a lot about the soul saved that we should be sending on ahead of us to heaven. Those, those are the kind of treasures we should be saving. Notice what James says will happen. If we selfishly hoard what we have, this guy who has all of this, who's wealthy in his grain, decides one day, I'm gonna go out to my barn and see all this grain that I have. And uh, so he uh, goes out to his barn, opens the barn door and finds that his grain has rotted and it's not fit for animals nor use for anyone. And then he goes to his closet, opens his closet door, looks at his garments, and they're moth-eaten. There are big holes everywhere in his garments. And, and he went to his deposit box and found that his silver and gold had cankered. And so he's talking about the idle money. This man had, if he had been, he was, if he had just used and utilized what he needed and saved some, he wouldn't have lost it all. But he kept hoarding and hoarding and hoarding and hoarding until after a while, he had way more than he needed. And, uh, and the money could have been used. If he had used it wisely, someone could have benefited from that. So James is saying you, you can support and help others through your possessions. Now, what about our own uh, unused wealth? It could be money, it could be stocks, bonds, other forms of wealth. It could be, let, listen to this. How many of you have a Bible? You must be having them with you tonight. <laughs> See, everybody's got a Bible. Okay, so if you got a Bible, an unused Bible, is just storing up wealth because there's a wealth of information a wealth of things that can bless us right here in this book if we don't use those then they're just sitting idly by that's idle treasure and uh, what about unused talents everybody's got a talent uh, you know everybody's given god, god has given everyone at least one spiritual gift some more than one through the power of the holy spirit he sovereignly chooses and gives those and he also gives other natural abilities that people have and so it, we, we don't always use those. It, it's, it's amazing to me how people are, have to be asked to get involved in a church. And with pastoring a long time, I understand that. You know, we, we would have to challenge people and challenge people. And I'd do sermons about it. And we'd go visit with people and talk to them individually. I was talking with a friend of ours in Macon, Georgia, this past weekend. I went down to do the wedding. <clears throat> and uh, he, he is a former uh, employee at, or, at, or administrator at... Uh, uh, Columbus State University and uh, very involved in his church's life. He coached me when I was in, uh, uh, and he's, he's a little bit younger than I am, but actually coached me on a softball team at one of the churches where I served on the staff earlier in my ministry. And um, he's retired now from Columbus State, <coughs> a preschool teacher in his church. Now, a lot of people think, well, you know, a preschool teacher, a man with this kind of character and standing status, he's going to teach little preschoolers. So he's just kind of. The pastor went to him and said, we need to move you. We didn't get your, you ought to be teaching adults in our Sunday school. So the, the man said, well, you know, I, I, I would consider doing that, but you need to talk to the preschool director before I make a commitment to do that. Well, the pastor went to talk to the preschool director, came back and said to him, 
if we tried, I was told if I tried to move you out of the preschool, that I would be gutted. He said. Wow. <laughs> so he said, we're going to leave you in the preschool right where you are because that's where you need to be. Uh, and so that's how much of an impression he had made on the preschoolers and parents and, and all those involved with them. Now, notice in verse 3, there is a testimony of this unused well. We can leave it unused. There's a testimony. It's a testimony uh, it, against us. It will witness against us, the Bible says. In fact, the, the scriptural principle is use it or lose it. So if we don't employ what we have, wealth, gifts, talents, abilities, and so forth, we'll lose them. And what we lose will testify against us, is what James said. Ultimately, it will test, testify against us in God's judgment uh, itself. God says we're not to hoard what we have, we're to use what we have for his glory. Now, we can support others the second way by avoiding illegal wealth. Not only dealing with that idle wealth we may have, but also avoiding illegal wealth. He says in verse 4, look, the pay that you have withheld from the workers who reap your fields cries out, and the outcry of the harvesters has reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. Notice that the, the two cities or the two, two cries against the wealthy uh, that James is talking about. He said they got their, their money illegally, and he said the first cry is the workers who have reaped the harvest, who have gone out and gathered the harvest. They're crying out because they didn't get paid, but you made all the money from the, from the grain. And so they were crying out. So they're, they're being in the status they were in. Uh, they're crying out. They're, they're poor in the status pain they were in was crying out against them. So the poor, uh, and they were they were poor and they were not paid. And they said, James said, this is the problem. So the word is crazo, actually. It means to, to shout or to scream or to cry out again. So unpaid wages cry out and reach the ears of God is what the, the Bible says. We always said money talks. In this case, it will talk. It will talk against us. Because if we have, either we have paid, either we've left wages unpaid with employees, or we have been paying them unfair wages. Either way, that will, will come against us. Let me say that God, not the government, is the one who is going to deal with poor, poorly paid wages, unfair wages, etc. Uh, in His time. The opposite of this, of course, is that a Christian who does not give an employer a day's work for a day's pay uh, is just as guilty. Uh, and, and so. The second cry then is these laborers' cries themselves will reach God because not only was their miserable state, their, the fact their unpaid wages talking, but now also they were crying out. And, uh, and so because they didn't get paid by their employers, they went home and told their families and they all cried together. And, and, and James says that God hears that. God knows when people are made miserable. So the ethical decisions we make, how we treat others, is very important. And then in verses 5 and 6, he talks about uh, our dealing with this whole wealth issue by allocating indulgent wealth. He says, you have lived luxuriously on the land and have indulged yourselves. You have fattened your hearts for the day of slaughter. You have condemned. You have murdered the righteous man. He does not resist you. James is describing here just kind of a wanton display for selfish pleasure. People just wanted more and more and more. They want to spend everything they had on the thing they had on themselves. There's nothing wrong with employing things that you can, with enjoying things you can buy, with employing money to buy the things you want. Nothing wrong with that. However, um, the problem is those things that we indulge in. I'm not talking about the necessities of life, but when we go over that and indulge ourselves in something, James says we will lose that uh, because they, they, we, we don't recognize the giver of those things. You'll wake up one morning and think, says, thinking all is well, and you get a call, and one call just absolutely blow your whole life away because you lost it all. Nothing wrong, again, with enjoying things, but we shouldn't become obsessed with it. So there are two purposes for money. One is to enjoy. The other is to employ. James says, enjoying the money is okay, but some of you have not employed the money. And uh, you, you've indulged in more and more and more things, way beyond you, what you could ever use. I mean, if, uh, when a person has uh, a garage that has six or seven automobiles in it, and he 
he doesn't need those, but he wants those. He just has to go in there and four, five thousand dollars, many, many thousand dollar vehicles, each of them. Uh, but pleasure is okay, but but if it becomes the number one aim in life, God looks at that and says, wait a minute, you know, you can employ that those resources, you can employ that money to do better than that. Uh, immature believers are guilty of these kinds of misuses of wealth, but if we're growing and maturing in Christ, we ought not to ever do this. If we're uh, making the transition to maturity in Christ, then these things ought not to happen in our lives. So James says then that we can we can actually support others and care for them through our possessions. The second thing he talks about is we can support others and care for them through our patience. Uh, in verses 7 through 12, we look there in just a moment. James says, uh, really, I want to teach you how to deal with other people and the important area of patience. Boy, I tell you, we, we all need a, a lesson in that. We don't want to pray for that, as I said last time, because God will teach us patience. But, but we really need to, to be more patient with one another. Therefore, brothers, be patient until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth and is patient with it until it receives the early and late rains. You also must be patient. Strengthen your hearts because the Lord's coming is near. Brothers, do not complain about one another so that you will not be judged. Look, the judge stands at the door. Talking here about the law of the harvest. We reap what we sow, we say many times, more than we sow, later than we sow. That is a law of the harvest. And so, I remember back in high school, down in Florida, uh, where I went to school and graduated from high school, it was interesting that uh, we had to take agriculture. That was a requirement of the state. If you didn't have four years of agriculture, you couldn't get out of high school in Florida. So I took agriculture for four years. Uh, fortunately, my dad was a, a bivocational pastor and pastor of a rural church, and I had some people who could help me know how to get underway with that because I was not familiar with that. But I learned how to sow seeds, and we, we grew things like corn, squash, peas, beans, cucumbers, tomatoes, those kinds of things in the garden, and uh, radishes, carrots, uh, potatoes, and I remember how my brother and I, I had a twin brother, and we were so impatient with the garden. We would plant it, but as soon as the thing started, to start, the sprouts came up out of the ground, we were like, I wonder, you know, potatoes, how long do they, how big do they have to be on top before they have something on the bottom? And then we would wait, and the vines would be all over the ground. We'd say, well, surely by now, we'd go out and try to scratch around. So we thought we could dig them up, and then we'd try to replant them. <laughs> we found out that didn't work. We were, we were impatient. Now, James says the farmer who is experienced knows to just wait with patience till the harvest comes in. He sows the seed. Uh, he, we, we laugh about the farmer sitting on his front porch in the rocking chair. Well, most farmers were busy during the time that they were waiting, but, they did, but, but, but also they, they, had the, they were the smart ones. They didn't dig it up. They didn't destroy it trying to see if it's, it's going to produce. Notice in verse 7, he talks about the early and late rain because the farmer waits for the fruit of the earth and has long patience with it until he receives the early and late rain. That's what he's teaching us here. So the early rain came in the fall. That caused seed to germinate. And then it was the late rain that came in the spring that caused the grain to swell and grow uh, and be ready to harvest. And that's what James is saying. He's saying that any farmer knows it takes patience it takes endurance. You have to wait till the harvest is ready to gather. So you, I, I, I just want to give you this thought of mine. I, I've said about it, reflecting on my farming days down there in the garden in, in the backyard. You got to water it, work it, weed it, and wait on it. See, those are the things you got to do. And if you if you're not willing to do that, you can't be a farmer. It will drive you absolutely up the wall. So there is no instant harvest. Uh, Paul says in Galatians 6 9 that we'll reap in due season if we do not faint. See, so some of us pass out on the way, can't wait any longer. You know, we, we just got to have the answer. Now, we want patience right now. I was thinking about on the way down to the wedding, we, we got within seven miles of our destination just outside of Macon, Georgia, and we were about two hours early. Thought we had all the time in the world to get to the hotel, check in, see the family, get to go over to the the uh, college where the, the chapel, the college where the wedding was being held, thought everything was going well, and all of a sudden, I 75, everything comes to a halt. Mm -hmm. We sat at one place, seven miles out of town, for 45 minutes. Now, we had driven all the way down there from here in about, what, four, a little four hours, and then we sit, sit there for 45 minutes and don't even move. 
uh, and I, I was watching people, you know, I was thinking about this, <laughs> and it kept me more calm than I would have been otherwise probably, but I was watching people running their cars up over the, the, uh, the, the bank on the side of the road trying to get out to a, an mm -hmm. exit ramp that was not too far away to see if they could find another way around it because mm -hmm. people are impatient. That, that tries our patience. We always are looking for a way to get around the problem. But James says no. The problem is we don't want to wait on God. He says we need to be patient and wait for God to bring the harvest. And uh, we need to be patient like the farmer who does that. We, with everything in our lives, we need to be patient with each other like the, the farmer is with his harvest. That's what he's saying. It's a good illustration. Tremendous illustration. By the way, who in the Old Testament is an outstanding poster couple? For this kind of thinking and living, impatient. I'm just impatient, can't wait. He was he was right, he was right at the top of the list of God's people when God said, I want you to take your family, go to a country you never heard of, and then I'll give you a son, all that, remember? And Abram, Abram and Sarah, and what did they do? But his at his wife's counsel, mm -hmm. you know, and he gladly jumped right on board. Yeah. They tried the deal, and then, yeah. then yes, and and so then he ended up with a child he shouldn't have had. And God said, "Oh, okay, I, you know, I, I want you to understand that, you know, you want it bad, you'll get it bad, as they say. If you look, if you want a child, you gonna get chi a child. You got a child." your way. Now, I'm going to give you the child the way I told you in the first place I was going to give you the child. And he did, didn't he? Because Isaac was born. And so, I think we're like the little boy sometimes that wanted pancakes. He's like, he tells mom, I want pancakes, I want pancakes. So she baked pancakes and she put them in front of him and, she, and he ate the pancake. And she said, oh, here, have some more. And um, pressed him to eat a little bit more. Uh, and he said, I don't want any more. I don't even want one of the ones I already have. Because <laughs> he'd already gotten so full and he thought, oh, I have had too much of this. So James pictured the Christian uh, as a spiritual farmer looking for a spiritual harvest. And he said, strengthen hearts, is what he said um, in verse 8. Um, strengthen your hearts because the Lord's coming is near. Sometimes our hearts become cold and wintry and God has to plow them up and God has to plant the seed all over again, and then he sends the sunshine and the rain. And so sometimes we have struggles, and sometimes we have uh, difficulty. Uh, but but he, through his goodness, his nurture, his care, uh, we have to be patient. We must be patient to wait for the harvest. And that's what he's saying here. Well, here is a secret of endurance when the going's tough, and that is God is producing a harvest in our lives. When it gets tough, God's blessing, God's producing fruit. How's it producing the fruit? It's producing the fruit through His Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. That's where the fruit are listed. And so, He can do it for us through trials and troubles if He chooses to do that. If we don't grow, if we get impatient and don't grow uh, His way, He can send the trial or the trouble. Uh, and so, instead of growing impatient with God and with ourselves, we have to yield to the Lord and permit his fruit to grow in us in its time. That's what he's talking about. Now, the farmer, as I said, doesn't just stand around doing nothing. He many times has a lot to do, but, but he's always looking for the harvest. He's got his eyes down the road knowing it's coming. James didn't tell us suffering believers to put on white robes, climb a, climb a hill, and, uh, uh, and wait for Jesus to come. He said, you know, be, be, keep working and waiting, he said. And so, uh, in fact, uh, the admonition that was given, uh, that Jesus gave in, the, uh, in his day, in Luke 12, 43, the slave whose master finds him working when he comes will be rewarded. See? So a lot of people are just, you know, gazing, see, looking for Jesus to come. When is Jesus coming? Maybe Jesus is coming soon. And, uh, and you, I want to be found faithful when he comes. I want to be at work when he comes. That, that's the way I think we should be. Nor does the farmer get into fights with his neighbors, um, which uh, is important here. Uh, one of the usual marks of farmers is their willingness to help each other. I mentioned my dad was a pastor in a rural community, and I tell you what, if one person, if one person had a problem, everybody in the church that knew about it had the same problem. They would come and, and help him fix it. They would do something about it. 
Nobody on the farm has um, time or energy for disputes with their neighbors because they're helping each other. If they're not doing their own work, they're helping one another. James says in verse 9, Brothers, do not complain about one another so that you will not be judged. Look, the judge stands at the door, he says. Impatience with God leads to impatience with others around us. That's going to happen. If we get impatient waiting for God to do something for us, if we start using the instruments of the harvest. See, if farmers, instead of using their instruments to harvest the grain, start using them to fight each other, what good have they done? That's what the, the example he's, he's giving here. We're supposed to mature so we are patient about our own needs uh, being met by God, and then we're to be equally patient with those around us. Now, uh, it, it's interesting to watch uh, his, his whole way of thinking here, process of thinking. Let me show you what he gives us here. He gives us the, the example of, the, of uh, the farmer. He now gives us an example of the prophets. Jewish believers would have understood this because uh, in Matthew 5, 10 through 12, uh, you recall in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talked about the Father, he said, will reward, uh, will, will reward them, the, the, those who have been faithful. Blessed are those, and he gave a list of the whole uh, list of things, of those things that they would be doing and involved and engaged in in their lives, and that God would reward that. So listen to James in chapter 5, verse 10. Brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the Lord's name as an example of suffering and patience. So these people were in the will of God doing what God wanted them to do, the prophets were, and yet they suffered what? Persecution, didn't they? And so Satan tells us that's because there must be some sin in your life. It's like Job's friends. And with friends like that, who needs an enemy, obviously? Uh, people say that, that uh, say sometimes to other Christians who are going through a tough time, must be some because some sin in your life. You know, people in even their closest group sometimes will, will think, well, must be some hidden sin in your life. This is why you're suffering. Well, look, no, there's nothing in the scripture that says everything's going to run perfectly smooth for a person who's faithful to God. Friends like Job's, for sure, are the kind of people who would rise up and, and point their finger and start to blame. Uh, but in 2 Timothy 3.12, Paul says this, in fact, all those who want to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. And we are told that the church will be persecuted. We're told that we will experience persecution in our lives. So Jesus was obedient, and yet it led to death on the cross. He himself was perfect, but he still died. He was persecuted and ultimately uh, cruelly crucified. Elijah, God's spokesman to Ahab about a drought, he suffered the drought himself. He announced the drought, didn't suffer the drought. God cared for him, though, and gave him victory. In fact, when he challenged the priests of Baal, you know, everybody wanted rain, everybody wanted water uh, because of the conditions of the country. Well, he said to the, the, the prophets of Baal, well, let's have a little contest. So they went out, and of course, you recall the result of that, um, the, the fact that, that obviously, um, Elijah was the man that God heard and not the Baal prophets. And, uh, and this is interesting to me. A little statement that I've seen, and, and I quoted it in your, in, in the, so you put it in your notes. The will of God will never lead us where the grace of God cannot keep us. See, Jeremiah suffered abandonment. Elijah suffered, as we said. And we're going to look back at him in just a moment. Jeremiah suffered abandonment in a well, but God fed him while he was in the well. He was faithful to God, in, in, in the well, uh, but God fed him there, protected him there. It, Ezekiel and Daniel both suffered hardship because they served God. God sometimes lets those who serve him suffer hardships, I think, in order to back up their testimony. So sometimes the difficulties we're going through is just backing. We say we're trusting God, so live through this and prove that you're trusting God. It's the kind of thing we're talking about here. Well, in verses 11 and 12, the example of Job. How many of us haven't heard the story? And here's what James says. See, we count as blessed those who have endured. You have heard of Job's endurance and have seen the outcome from the Lord. The Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Now, above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath. Your yes must be yes, your no must be no, so you won't fall under judgment. James was saying we consider... Uh, or call those blessed who have endured trials. 
He's, he's talking about God's allowed trials in our lives. See, there are no blessings without battles, is what he's saying. You, you want to, to win. No, no peaks without valleys. See, we could say that many different ways. Uh, we've got to get ready for the fight, the battle. Paul had his thorn in the flesh. Why was that given to him? So that he would keep him humble. And uh, so that he would have a good testimony for God around uh, those that were around him. So God blesses us through the trials that come our way. Three Hebrew children are another good example of this. Uh, in, in Daniel 3, James says, We are blessed after we've endured. They were blessed after they went through the fiery furnace. Even through the fiery furnace they were blessed. So, I don't know if you've read or studied the book of Job very seriously, but the first three chapters tell us about his distress. Wealth gone, family gone, except for his wife. Health gone, his wife might as well have been gone because she told him, why don't you just curse the whole thing and, uh, and ask God to take the life. Chapters 4 through 31 are conversation with his friends, so-called. And uh, goodness. Uh, with, who, who wants to debate with friends like those? Because they were, of course, accusing him. It had to be his fault. God allowed him to be humble through all of this, but God honored him. Uh, and, and this is the interesting thing. As I said before, God gave uh, limited access to Job in that experience so he could tempt him, but God used the same experiences to test him. And this is what the Scripture says. So, uh, Job 42, 12 says... So the Lord blessed the last part of Job's life more than the first. He owned 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys. Now, I'm not sure what 1,000 female donkeys were for, <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, he had a multitude more of all of what he had in the end. The, the end of him was better than the beginning. It was better after he suffered. And listen to Job's own testimony. Uh, we'll see that. Uh, after God had seen him through the test, as God gave him limited access by the devil, to the devil to, to be tempted, or, or, and then God tested him, Job said this, he said, I, Job 42, 5, I had heard rumors about you, God, but now my eyes have seen you. See, how many of us are giving testimonies that somebody, based on what somebody else has told us about God or about Christ, see? We ought to have a personal testimony of what Jesus means to us, what God means in our lives. Uh, because if not, we're like Job was prior to the test. You know, we're saying, well, I'm giving testimony of what I've, well, this is what I've heard about you, God. I've heard rumors. But now, boy, after walking through that test, now my eyes see you. And so, amazing. Uh, I think, <coughs> not the word, wait, the word, the same word we saw the other night in James that, Tell you honest, uh, the, the end of the purpose of God in his life. Job said the end of, when I look at my life, I see what, what I was trying to make of myself, then I see what God made of me, and now I see that now I have reached the end of the purpose of God for my life. People looking all over the place trying to find meaning and purpose in life today. We find our meaning and purpose by finding God's purpose for us and getting involved in that, and then we know what our purpose for being here is. So this testimony of Job, I think, means that uh, some trials of life are caused by satanic opposition. There's no doubt. Some trials of life may be caused by uh, our yielding to temptations we yield to along the way. Uh, but, but really, the tri some trials come from God. And God sends them as tests uh, to prepare us and make us who he wants us to be. So the answering, answer in suffering and trial is, uh, is in Paul's words, my grace is. Uh, is sufficient for you, he said. That, 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 that's why God said, my grace is sufficient. You know, I'm not going to take away the, I'm not going to remove the thorn. I, my grace is sufficient. And Paul said, then, you know, let me have all the more of the difficulty because I want to know more and more abundant grace of how, how meaningful that is. So when you fill your head into the furnace, head to the throne of grace. That's good counsel. That's what Paul did. Um, God has a purpose then uh, to emotional weakness and spiritual weakness and whatever kind of weakness we may go through. So if you're sick, so sick you can't function, uh, you're to call, call the elders is what uh, James says uh, in, in our lives. Um, let me ask skip. I believe I'll just about to skip over a, a chapter here, um, which I didn't want to skip over. 
So, uh, and whatever is coming upon you, we, we, I, I should have mentioned, well, God has a purpose in whatever is coming upon you. He'll work out the end of his purpose in our lives. Job cursed the day he was born. Do you, you realize that? He did finally do that, but he never cursed God, and he never, he never spoke a foolish oath against God. A good Christian person needs few words to make a convincing statement. We don't have to say much. If we know what we're talking about and we're living right with God, we don't have to swear by an oath. And that's what um, James is talking about there as well. Well, we're to support others through our prayers. I was about to get ahead of myself and get into this section just a moment ago. in verses 13 through 20. James has talked about our tongues several times in the book, if you recall. Uh, he spoke of using the tongue for complaining, chapter 5, verse 9. Swearing, chapter 5, verse 12. Uh, but more positively, he mentions its use for proclaiming God's word in the 10th verse and the 13th verse. And we're going to look at that. A mature Christian prays in the troubles of life, as we've just seen coming out of the previous verses. So let's look at verse 13. Pray with those who are suffering. He said, is anyone sick among you? Anyone among you suffering? He should pray. Is anyone cheerful? He should sing praises. So we're studying the issue of supporting others. The greatest assistance we can give to a person in need around us is faithful prayer, intercessory prayer. And now, in order to, for us to pray intelligently about another person's needs, guess what? We've got to know them and be familiar enough with the need to know what to pray for them. See, if we don't know what's going on with them, if we're not close to them, we have no clue. We can't pray intelligently. So James is saying here, we've got to be close enough to each other and support each other and be near enough to each other that we can know what the needs are. And he picks two aspects of our lives to exhort us to be supportive in the areas of prayer and praise. Suffering should elicit prayer, he says. If you're suffering, then you ought to pray. And sufficiency, abundance, is also a thing that should elicit prayer. And so... He gives us some examples. Every trouble is a call to prayer. I don't care what it is. Every trouble is a call to prayer. It's like the man who was seated in an airplane for a flight over, intercom, over the intercom system on the flight. He heard this message. Sit back and relax. This plane is fully automatic. The pilot is automated. Food server is automated. Landing devices are fully automatic. You are perfectly safe. Enjoy your flight. Nothing can go wrong. Nothing can go wrong. Nothing can go wrong. <laughs> every affliction, every setback is a summons to prayer. I think it really is. So mm -hmm. don't waste a good crisis is what I've always said. A crisis is an opportunity to call on God. If, if there's a crisis in your life, call on God about it. And no, no, nothing better to do. Now, by the way, he says there's some things James says about them applying this prayer thing. He says that for those who are sick, suffering or sick, they are to call us, he said. See, uh, we don't just go around peddling prayers. I had a, a Catholic sister who was a, a good friend of mine uh, down in Columbus, Georgia, Sister, sister Maria, at St. Francis Hospital, sweet lady, dear lady. And she would just say, I'd walk into the hospital and she'd be there because she was going around battling prayer. <laughs> I just told her, and she, she looked at me and she said, if this is one of yours, I don't need to be here because I know you're going to come. <laughs> so I would go in the room and one day she took me by the hands when we were walking the door. She held my hands and, and she said, now, she said, Brad, today would you just send up a little prayer for me? <laughs> And I said, Sister Maria, I'll be glad to do that. So I prayed for her, obviously. Uh, and, and I think it's very important for us to stand, understand that we, we need to be capable of supporting and praying for and caring for those who have special needs. Uh, but whatever those needs may be. When someone asks, what are we to do? James says, first of all, pray for them. Pray with them, he says. In verse 14, he said that he should call for the elders of the church. Now, what does that mean? It means we should inform others who we know who are faithful prayer warriors. It doesn't have to be the senior pastor of the church. It, it, may, it may be someone else, as we're going to see in, in a moment here. But the point is that when someone contacts us and says, I've got a need, if we're in their life group, I mean, we're a confidant of theirs or a good friend of theirs, and they call us, we should begin by praying with them. We shouldn't pass them off to somebody else. We should sit down and pray with them. And secondly, pray believing. Uh, in, the, in the 15th verse, 
God honors and answers prayers when we expect them to be answered. And so if, if we don't expect God to answer our prayers for somebody we're praying for, we're wasting our time and there's praying for them. <coughs> That's God's blessing. Because God's answers take believing on the part of the person of need and the intercessor both. Very important to remember that. And um, we're going to see how, how significant that is here in a moment. And then pray sincerely. We, can't, we cannot all pray for everybody. No, you can't do that. But everybody can pray for somebody. And so if there is someone who happens to call you, if you're their prayer partner, or if you're a, in a part of a prayer team, whatever the case may be, I've found that God burdens my heart for certain people at certain times. And uh, I've, I've got two young ladies down in Columbus, Georgia, that uh, uh, one of whom I uh, supported and prayed in the ministry uh, when they, were, they thought they would never have a child given to them, and God gave them two children, and the third one was born this morning. Uh, so when, when all their attempts didn't work, God's plan worked. And another couple that are they're dear friends of mine that uh, have been uh, wanting another child, and wondered if they would be able to have another child. They had a little boy. I had done dedication for him all these, probably six, seven years old now. And they've waited all this time, but through all this time, we've been, I've, I've ministered with her and cared for her and prayed for her, and she's been on my prayer list, and her husband and family all along the way. And I prayed specific things that I felt God burdened me about to pray for in that regard. And she has conceived and is going to have a child born to her shortly. And so I found that God puts that kind of burden on my heart for people to pray for them. So pray repeatedly, he says, too. Elijah, verse 17, was a man with a nature like ours, yet he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain. Now, do you know after this experience that he had uh, with the prophets of Baal and all that, the Bible says that he went up on top of the Carmel and he prayed. And he started praying and sent his servant out. How many times? Yeah. Seven, seven times. Oh, seven Six times he went, came back, no, nothing. Seven. Seventh time, he came seven. back. Yep, there's a little cloud the size or shape of a hand that's forming. And uh, of course, Elijah said yes. And he, he told, told Ahab, he said, you better get in your chariot and, and haul it from here right now, because if you don't, you'll get caught in a flood. Uh, and so, now, you see, he kept praying. He was persistent in his prayer. He repeatedly prayed for things. Sometimes we'll pray one time or two times or ten times and we're done. You know, well, well I guess that's not God's plan. No, I think we ought to be persistent. If You know, I've, I've been persistent, as I was just saying, with this friend of mine over all these years. And now God has blessed and added another one to their family in answer to, of course, obviously her prayers and our prayers as well. And so we need to show ourselves that we are serious about our request. God already knows whether we're serious or not. We need to know that we're serious about the request. In verses 14 through 16, then pray for the sick as well. He says, when we get sick, we are, what, what are we to do? Is any, uh, is any sick among you? He should call the elders of the church. And they should pray over him after anointing him with olive oil in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, the word he uses here for sick is... Asthenia, uh, that means to be sick uh, or to be weak or to be in need. It's, this is not a sore throat or stuffed tuck. This is, I mean, this is serious business. This is a person who is so sick he can't function. He is not even ambulatory. Uh, and so he's, he's bedridden. It, it could be a physical illness, could be an emotional illness, some people have, could be a mental illness, spiritual illness, whatever it is. James, he's not giving an order here about what we're to do, but he's giving us an opportunity. He says, if you're so sick that you cannot function, then you are to call the elders of the church. Now, I want us to look at this elders issue for just a moment, because in a contemporary church like this, with all the staff and everything we have going on here, uh, we, we need to understand what this may apply to and how it applies to us and our with our own needs. Let me, let me say, that there are three words used interchangeably for the same office in the New Testament. These are the three. Elder is one, bishop is one, shepherd is one. I believe all three of those apply to the same office. Now that it was used in James' day, primarily I think, of a pastor of a church. Now, I think if we just simply applied that principle 
you know, to say we're going to be adamant about that. Some people are adamant about this. You know, say it's called the pastor, you know, or call the pastors. Churches have multiple teaching pastors, multiple pastors, etc. No, listen. Let, let, me, let me say the day of multiple staff people. I think it would it could be a staff person that you feel is accountable for you, someone you feel close to, someone you feel you could call and and would would hear and respond to you. Could be a deacon, uh, or a deacon, because the deacons here do not have to handle with the business affairs of the church because the church has the, the senior pastor working with with the trustees. And so those things get handled and deacons are free to re be responsive to needs. Or it could be calling someone in your life group. It could be calling someone that you have confidence in, in the church. It's, it's, it's saying go to the church. That's your family. That's where uh, you ought to be able to find help. So go to one of those people that you feel led to and call to. Call them and tell them about the illness, how sick you are and that you want them to pray for you. Now, verse 14 we're to cooperate with God's laws of healing. He Notice he says, verse 40, he should call to the church and they should pray over him after anointing him with olive oil in the name of the Lord. In James' day, an elder in the church, a pastor of the church, would take a bottle of oil with him and he would be ready to anoint the, the one who had the need. There are some people today who still practice the uh, do the practice of um, massaging the forehead, for example, with oil. Uh, and I, I do not believe that that's what that means here. Some people already have their minds made up and they won't listen to any kind of teaching in regard to it or what it might mean. Uh, however, I think we, we've come in this classroom with that. We, we haven't checked our minds at the door. We've brought our minds with us, so we've been using our minds as we've studied, and we can do that at this point, I think, as well. Let's use our brains and let's learn what the Bible really means here. When it talks about anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. To begin with, there are two distinct words in the New Testament that are translated anoint, two words for anoint. One is creo, that is, there is the sacred word where Christ comes from himself. He was anointed of his father. Jesus was anointed, and that is a sacred sense in which God anointed him. He may anoint others for particular types of service, etc. That is the sacred term, the setting apart, setting something apart. Luke 4, 4, 18, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me, is what Jesus says. Now, that's not the word James used. So we shouldn't use that, that type of application here. Rather than using that sacred word, he uses alepho. That, that, this is the secular word meaning to rub in, some, to rub something in, or to grease something up. Uh, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of, Jesus, uh, mother of James, um, <coughs> came to the grave to find Jesus. They wanted to anoint his body for burial. Mm -hmm. Now, they brought spices that, that's so they could anoint Jesus' body. That's the word James uses here to massage or rub in. It was a word used to describe the athletes in Greece who got bumps and bruises and muscles torn and, 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 and uh, ligaments and so forth and they had to, to be rubbed with oil to relax them on the day of the race. Oil it was used and still is used today in some parts of the world for cooking and lighting and for medicinal purposes because there, there is a healing quality in the oil is, is their belief. And so in verse 14 he says, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. He's not talking about anointing in the sacred use. It's not some religious ceremony that we are to do. He was talking about anointing in the secular use that is to relieve physical suffering. So it was anointing as an act to relieve physical suffering. And verse 14 uh, it literally, literally says that, that they should pray over him after they anoint him with oil. See, so what James says is get the best medical help you can and then pray for them. So, so if, if I were called for that, I always told people, you know, if, you, if you're if you in a medical emergency of some type, you call 911 and then you call me. You know, I'll pray for you after you get the medical help underway. Uh, and so that's why that's the exact order that James says here. And so God uses prayer and means in healing is what I believe. Uh, some people just, you know, there's some groups today that want to say, you know, well, you don't even have to go to the hospital. Just, you know, uh, I guess the Christian scientists and others who would just say, we stay, stay at home, don't worry about it. Well, you know, we're, we're not going to the hospital. Uh, and and you know, keep your kids out of the hospital and get a lawsuit over without having to take their children to get the medical attention they needed. So we don't want to be extreme in any way here or that. 
And so, in the name of the Lord here, it means according to the will of the Lord. So, uh, verse, four, verse 14, commit their lives to the will of God. But once we pray for them, they've got medical attention, we're praying for them, we commit their lives to the will of God. We don't try to impose our own will. Um, as we seek medical attention, again, call the elders and do the, all these things he said, we are to pray, not my will, but yours be done. Uh, which is exactly what Jesus did. In verse 15, then, count on God's answer because the prayer of faith will save the sick person and the Lord will restore him to health. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. What is the prayer offered in faith? It's a prayer offered believing that God's will is going to be done. Believing that. We encounter people, I, I encounter people that along the way will say, Brad, will you pray for me uh, to pray that God will make me well. And uh, I will say, yes, I'll pray that God will make you well. Uh, and uh, try to be supportive of them and never criticize them for that. Um, and then when they don't get well, somebody says, well, I thought you prayed for me to get well. What's the deal on that? Is where your prayer is no good? No. But let's see. Let's look at that for just a moment. Maybe a person's faith has something to do with that and may affect the issue some. But listen again, here in James, it's not the sick man's faith that's in question. It's the faith of the people praying that's in question. And so, so when, when I or one of my family members has a crisis, what I do is I call the person in who's pray, who, who, who I know are praying with faith. They're going to pray believing that the prayers are going to be answered. I don't want somebody that's praying not believing the prayers are going to be answered praying for my folks. See? I don't want them praying for me. Uh, I don't want to pray for anybody uh, and not believe. I, I believe. I, when I say, I always say to a person, look, I will pray that God will heal you. But I always would say to them, if God has something better in store for you, then I'm, gonna, I'm not going to ask God to take away the best and give you the better. I'm going to ask God to give you the best. Because I know that he'll, he'll, he, he knows better than I do. And his will is better than my will. And so it's the faith of the people praying that uh, James says is an issue here. Look at verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another so that you may be healed. The urgent request of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. Now, does God always heal the physical body? No. no. He does heal the physical bodies. He does not always do it. He may do it, but he does not always do it. And so, verse 16, notice there is this whole issue of confession that goes along with this. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The urgent request of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. And that, I think that is so very, very important for us to understand. This is the reason we don't see more healing, perhaps. This is the reason we don't hear more answered prayers. Because we are, that we are, are not, we're not setting up the... the the atmosphere for healing because we haven't confessed our sins. We conceal our sins instead of confessing. We love to criticize and castigate, uh, particularly our, our, our criticized friends castigate the fuckers, as they say, uh, and we're good at that. But the Bible doesn't say that we're to criticize our friends. The Bible says that, we're, that we are to confess our own faults. So if the one praying and the one asking for the prayer both have confessed their sins, they put themselves in a position where God can bless them. Because I think we need to stay confessed up to date. I, I always believe the, the analogy that we, it's like spiritual breathing. That, you know, we exhale through confessing our sins. We inhale the fullness and power of the Spirit to put him back in control of our lives. I always want someone who's exhaled and now has inhaled the control of the Spirit by his life to be praying for me. And, and I should be the same for the person who, for whom I am praying. Now, notice that when we confess our faults, this is what happens. Restoration occurs. Uh, God sometimes uses this principle, I think, in the healing of homes, for example, families that are broken. Uh, he heals work and professional relationship. He heals spirits. He heals bodies as well. Um, he restores people physically and relationally uh, through mutual confession. And also reconciliation occurs because uh, people who are at odds with odds of that, I know some people have lived next door to somebody I hadn't spoken to in 10 years. And uh, you know what a shame to, particularly with the, the zero lot lines most of us have these days, you, you ought to hope that you can be a little more friendly than that. 
uh, but just resentment and, and distrust builds up and, and we make ourselves, you say, well, we make ourselves so vulnerable though if we confess, no, listen, we make ourselves believable if we are honest with, with one another in a reasonable way. Now, notice that James also says revival will occur. And you say, well, e listen, every great revival has been preceded by the confessions of God's people. Again, back in the Old Testament, my people call my name will humble themselves and uh, seek, my seek, yes, seek my face and turn from their wicked yeah. ways. Repent and confess. Yes, that's what he's after. Verses 17 and 18, let's see that we are to pray for the state as well. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, yet he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. For three years and six months it did not rain on the land. Then he prayed again, and the sky gave rain, and the land produced its fruit. Elijah is, was a righteous man. So James uses him as an example of a righteous man. The background for what he's referring to here is in, in 1 Kings 1, 17 and 18. They have Jezebel. Uh, you know the whole deal there. And um, we already talked about him defeating the prophets of Baal. Um, and, and you say, well, but, but here's a, a guy who was so much different than I am. He, he was so religious and righteous and good. And I'm not, no, no, no. He was just like all the rest of us are. He was a man, with, with, as we're going to see, with very much like we are in the moment. But notice what he does. He goes and prays. He prayed once, uh, and then um, fire came from heaven. And uh, so it worked. The next time he goes and prays, what did we say? It took seven times. He had to keep praying over and over and over again. So we are to enter our prayer closets regularly, is what he says in verse 17. Now, the nation still needed the rain after the Baal prophet thing had taken place. So Elijah went up on Carmel, as we said. He prayed the seven times, and God finally sent the rain. Now, do you think our nation needs the rain, needs the, the healing blessing of showers of blessing from God, like Ahab's needed that Elijah was praying for? Do you think our nation needs that kind of blessing? I think we do. Absolutely. I think we need that kind of revival and new beginning. You say, but I'm not Elijah. I'm not like, mm, but listen, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. So James said, I knew you were going to say that. So I'm just going to take that argument away from you. He's just like we were. Uh, after Elijah defeated the prophets of Baal, what did he do? He had this whole mountaintop experience and then he took off because he heard Jezebel was after him and he fled and hid in the cave and said, God, take my life. I'm done with it. Uh, I'm the only one you got left. And there were 400 other prophets beside him. He didn't know where they were, didn't know who they were. So he thought it was only him. And God said, no, no, more than that. Well, so God promises to answer the prayer, prayer for all of his children, not just for a spiritually elite group of people. So when we pray, we all believe that God will answer, just like Elijah believed that God would answer. And then earnestly call on the Lord. Notice we're to pray not in vain repetitions. That's what James is talking about when he says he prayed earnestly. He wasn't using just vain, rote kinds of expressions that he'd learned in a liturgy somewhere. Um, he, he, the little, little translation of the Greek text is he prayed with prayer. And I think that's neat. Some people do not pray in their prayers. They say religious words. And James said, don't just re use religious words. Your hearts and minds are not in concert in your prayers. He, he said, you let your mind speak what your heart's feeling, what your heart knows as reality. Sometimes God wants to say, I'm sure, in the middle of our prayers, we're just, you know, doing this rote memory, you know, just giving it, you know, God's heard it so many times, he's probably sick of it, and I think sometimes God wants to say, what do you want? <laughs> Tell me what you need. Uh, in verse 18, expect God to answer. So we need to pray for our nation with the conviction that God will answer and can and will change things. We, we need to look at the past answers that God has given to his people. Uh, the prophets and all these others that we've just seen, Job, that we've seen as examples. And we, we need to believe that no matter how bad it's gotten over the recent years, that God can still revive us again. See? So we've seen that we're to, we are to pray for the suffering, the sick, the state, but also to pray for the straying, he says in verses 19 through 20. My brothers, if any among you strays from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his life from death and cover a multitude of sins. 
Well, th th this is dealing with people who stray away from God's truth, have not read his word. This, this is not a gradual drifting, uh, excuse me, this is, if this is like a gradual drift. It's not like a sudden, I just wake up one morning and say, I'm just going to get live for the devil today. I'm just going to change my whole lifestyle, chunk my whole faith, and quit the Christian thing. That's not what this is all about. It's like a gradual moving in a direction opposite the way of God. It says, I'm going to go the way I want to go. And Paul in Galatians 6 uh, talks about one being taken in a fault. That was not someone who just suddenly stumbled into something. It was someone who made a decision, a conscious decision, and chose to sin, and he said it was caught red-handed, and what are you supposed to do with it? Be patient with him because consider, consider your own mistakes of the same kind. So this sin that James is talking about is a result of a slow decline, gradually drifting, it's closing this book instead of opening it, it's letting this treasure be unused and idle in, in our homes. And eventually just getting away from God's plan because we don't hear it, we don't read it, we don't study it, we don't talk about it, we don't go to church. I've, I've said many times that this book will keep you from sin or that sin will keep you from the book. You know, if, if you don't stay in here, you'll live like the world lives. Uh, if, you, if we don't go to church, some people, I don't need church. Well, yeah, we do too. Because uh, in fact, most of the time, the, the word church is used in the Bible is talking about the local body. We need, the local, we need to be part of the local body. We, in fact, we have a gift or gifts that belong to a, a church, a local body. need to employ those and use those. And so uh, James says, pray for them, verse 19. These are Christians, not believers, that he's talking about. Uh, because sin in the life of a Christian is worse than sin in the life of an unbeliever. Because we, we say some, we are some, we're different. So we ought to be different. We expect unsaved people to do a certain number of things. Well, that, you know, they're, because they're unsaved. But when a Christian does it, we're like, well, wait a minute. That's hypocritical, see. And so verses 19 20 says, not only pray for them, but point them back to God's way. Pray for them and seek to help them, he says. Now, let me ask a question. Do believers need to be converted? Do believers need to be converted? And before you answer that, then I, you probably see the answer already is yes. Believers do need to be converted. Listen, Jesus said to Peter in, in Luke 22, 32, when you are converted, now he's already saved, but he was a backslider. And Jesus said to him, when you are converted, strengthen, my, strengthen the brethren. So it's important for us to win the loss. First Peter 4, 8, Peter, to whom Jesus was speaking, said, Love should cover a multitude of sin. We've got this kind of work to do. We need to be ministering with and caring for. When a person has strayed from God, we need to point them back to God's way and, and help convert them back to God's way. Look, look again what James says. Whoever turns a sinner, converts a sinner from the error of his way will save his life from death. That is the one who strayed. My goodness, that, that's important. There are more... There, probably, there, may be, there may be a ton of Christians <coughs> in this area who need to be converted back to the way that they've chosen, uh, as well as sinners who need to be saved. And then prohibit, prohibit a wasted life is, is what he says in verse 20. If we can get a person who, who has a relationship with Christ, um, we won't have to, he doesn't have to get him saved again, but if we can get that life back into the walk that he should have with Christ, then listen, we, have, we may have gained back a friend. We certainly have gained back a brother or sister in Christ uh, that, that, are, that will be close to us and, and will help minister with me. Because, because this kind of prayer and bringing one back, what does he say? It says it converts, covers a multitude of sin. So it writes relationships between us. It doesn't mean that we sweep the dirt under the rug. Where there is love, there must also be truth. Ephesians 4.15, which is, again, my logo and, and, my, and my ministry, teaching ministry, has always been truth lovingly told or telling it with love. Mm -hmm. So uh, because I believe that that's, that in fact, my calling came out of the, uh, the, the, the couple of passages in the fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians. And, uh, and God always convinced me that I need to tell the truth but tell it with love. And by doing that, people always knew I wasn't mean from the pulpit. I was not a mean. I, in fact, they, I demonstrated to them that I loved them because I was there for them in the, in the trenches just like I was trying to teach them on Sunday. 
So with our truth, there is to be honest confession and cleansing and restoration, is what James says. All of those things happen when we do that. So love not only helps the offender, faces things and deal with them, but also uh, once forgiven, those sins are remembered no more. We can tell them, you know, just like David said, Lord, when you sin, gone, it's gone, and God doesn't even have a record of it. He lifts it out of you, expiates it, takes it away. He's he hides it from his face so he does not see it any longer, and he keeps no record of it. He's expunged the record. Doesn't even know that you've ever committed the sin. Awesome thought. Uh, as we conclude the study in the book of James. Now, let me challenge you. I, I gave you an extra sheet there tonight. Uh, questions to reflect on. And those are not about this specific study only and are not original to me, but I wanted to use those as a kind of home study for you to, to challenge you to think over what we've talked about here and kind of maybe answer some of those questions in your own lives as you, you see fit to answer them after the study's over. I have been blessed, as I said, by each of you being here in your tenderness and love of God's Word. I love to teach people who love God and love His Word. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a joy for me to have the opportunity to do that. And thank Sandy and Brian for coming on, Brian, for helping me out here. And then both of them and technology have gone along the way, and his son, Evan, as well. God, we thank you for this time tonight. And thank you for teaching us once again from your word. You are a powerful and mighty and awesome God. We thank you for your teaching through James, that, that your spirit inspired him to write these very relevant words for the 21st century. Help us to take them into our hearts and minds and apply them to our circumstances in our lives every day is our prayer in Jesus' name.